For those of you who don't know me, my name is Ashley Vaughn. This is my second year teaching at Moore Park. I teach cultural anthropology. You may be wondering, well, what is that, and what does anthropology have to do with birth? Well, basically, if humans are doing it, then anthropologists are studying it. Um, so my specialty is medical anthropology, which is concerned with how cultures shape how people view their bodies, how they define health, and also how they diagnose and treat illness. In my course, Anthropology of Women, we have been discussing some of these topics. For example, we have considered how culture shapes people's experiences of biological processes, like menstruation, menopause, and of course, pregnancy and birth. While anthropology as a field historically has focused on studying non-Western or indigenous cultures, nowadays anthropologists study Western cultures as well, including American culture. In fact, today there are more American anthropologists doing research in the United States than outside of it. So medical anthropologists who specialize in pregnancy and birth have studied how Americans view these life experiences. They compare American birth ideologies and practices with other cultures around the world. And what they have found is that Americans view birth as a dangerous and even pathological condition. And they think of it as something that needs to be medically managed. In anthropology, we refer to this, and I've put some of these words on the board here, we refer to this as the medicalization of birth. What's interesting to us is that the majority of people around the world do not medicalize birth, but see it as a natural process, not something that is a crisis, a life crisis. Due to Western influence, more and more women are giving birth in hospitals globally. However, many continue to prefer to give birth in their homes or villages with the help of traditional birth attendants. We use the term birth attendant to refer to anyone who assists a pregnant woman before, during, or after her labor. The medicalization of birth, which began in the 1900s in the US, has led to what we call an interventionist model, where even during normal births, the norm is for there to be many biomedical interventions, such as the administration of pharmaceuticals. The power of this cultural idea that birth is a medical condition, combined with the value Americans place on technology and the social status Americans assign to doctors, has led to statistics like 98% of women giving birth in hospitals, 80% receiving epidurals, 90% receiving episiotomies, and a C-section rate of 32.7% from 2013. All of this, in, despite the fact that 95% of births are normal. Just for reference, according to the World Health Organization, a normal rate for C-sections is between 10 and 15 percent compared to our 32.7. While the C-section rate is increasing, there's also what we call in anthropology and sociology a counter-movement. So since the, six, the 1960s and 70s, we've seen growth in midwifery, home births, and women advocating for more birthing options and control over their births in general. Just a brief disclaimer. Our goal in putting on this event is not to advocate, mine at least, for any specific type of birth. Um, what we're trying to do here is just shed light on some of the complexities and so all of the challenges and decisions that women and their partners face presently due to this current cultural environment. In the US, women may choose to give birth in a hospital, at home, in a freestanding birthing center, or a birthing center in a hospital. They may opt to have a doctor, a midwife, a certified nurse midwife, or a doula to help them along the way. Having more options means birth-related decision-making has become more complicated. Women may experience social pressures to go one route or the other, and they may encounter conflicting messages about birth. That is why it's so great to have Brandy here to discuss these complexities. Brandy is a certified mentor specializing in teaching childbirth classes, attending births as a doula, and working with women who have had traumatic birth experiences. So please help me welcome Brandy by giving her a round of applause. Hello, everyone out there. Thank you for having me. Thank you, Ashley, for the introduction. 
Um, so my name is Brandy Pearson. I have two children I gave birth to. So that gives me a little bit of seasoning, a little bit of knowledge about, uh, about birth. So um, I'm also a certified birthing from within mentor. So I does, has anybody here heard of birthing from within? Is that a familiar? Okay, so nobody. All right. So uh, birthing from within. Yes, okay. Oh, I need to be louder. Oh, okay, I'm going to be shouting at you all. Um, birthing from within was a book written by a wonderful, brilliant midwife named Pam England. And she helped numerous women achieve, her, achieve their natural births uh, in the home setting. And uh, Pam, like many w midwives, uh, believed that natural birth could be achieved if you thought the right thoughts, ate the right foods, did the right exercises, that it was kind of an easy sort of thing to achieve if you just did all the right things. So Pam found herself shocked when she gave birth to her first baby by cesarean. This created a huge paradigm shift for her, which is what did I need to know to give birth that I didn't know? What is the deeper preparation for women and for couples who are about to give birth? Because she found out that you cannot just earn a birth. You can't do the right things and get, get the birth that you want. So she wrote the book Birthing from Within based on that philosophy. How do we prepare parents and specifically women about to you know, walk through the ordeal of birth to, to do this thing that our society doesn't really um, set a foundation for us to do. So Pam does, did, wrote this amazing book, and then from there, she created a sisterhood and a lengthy certification process um, so that people like myself could go through it and learn how to teach childbirth classes based on this philosophy that is not outcome-focused. So when I say I'm a certified birthing from within mentor, it means I teach these classes. So the classes cover things like um, practical pain coping techniques. That is the kind of center stone of our classes is we uh, teach a bunch of tools with how to cope with the intensity and the pain of labor. And we have women hold ice so they can get a feeling of what does it feel like to be put in an uncomfortable situation and to use these techniques. So women start to go, oh, I did this technique, and that really worked because I didn't feel the ice. But when I did this technique, I, I kind of couldn't get into that. So it's helpful to not just tell women, when you're in labor, you should meditate. You should relax. But to have them practice it beforehand and get some confidence and also know where they maybe need to work a little bit harder. So, um, so that's, that's what I do. I teach classes like that. We talk about things like the nuts and bolts of labor, what's happening to your body, um, specifically, we talk about how to ask questions of your care providers because something that we don't realize is that just that piece alone take away all the other things that affect a birth. A monkey. <laughs> That's normal, right? <laughs> all right. Okay. <laughs> all right then. Oh, we are like near a zoo. Okay. All right. Um, so even just talking to our care providers, how do you know when, some, when your care provider is telling you what is true? How do you know what isn't true? How do you know what's based on their fears? How do you know what isn't? So even that is a huge thing that um, couples need to be savvy with how to talk about these things. So we cover things like that. But then we also cover um, the more right-brained kind of stuff, which is um, how might you get through labor when you don't know what to do next? If your baby turns breech, and you know there's di there's different ways this is handled, but in a hospital, uh, you're not allowed to deliver a breech baby. In most hospitals, you're not allowed to deliver a breech baby uh, vaginally. So, how would you deal with that if your baby turned breech and they said we need to do a cesarean right now? So, women, we aren't preparing women. If we tell them you eat these foods, here's a study, here's why this is safe, you aren't teaching them how do you become resourceful? How do you make the next step? Even when you don't know what to do, it's the last thing that you wanted. So, those are the kind of classes I teach, which are more kind of the soul of, of birth. Um, in addition to that, I also serve as a doula. So, a doula um, is different than a midwife. A midwife is a medical person, and a doula is a non-medical person. So I am there to help support a woman and her partner through labor. So this means I'm there doing massage, helping encourage, uh, 
offering up, hey, maybe we should do a change of position. Um, I am not allowed to speak for the woman. So if a doctor comes in and says, hey, you know, things are going a little slow, so we want to give some Pitocin, we want to get things going a little bit, I'm not allowed to say, she shouldn't do that, or yes, you should do that. So I have to be very creative, and because women often hire me to be um, kind of like a gatekeeper and also kind of like a mediator, so I have to be very smart about how I handle things like that. So instead of saying you should or shouldn't do, which by the way, I don't know what people should or shouldn't do. Birth is a mystery. Birth is complex. There's no right answer. I ask a whole bunch of stupid questions in front of everybody so that then parents can figure out what to do. So I may ask, well, are there alternatives? Are there other things that we can do other than Pitocin? And then the doctor may say, well, yeah, we can try whatever. And then the mom is unable to say, okay, well, maybe I want to try those things. So, um, so that's my role as a doula. That is not the bulk of my work because I have two kids at home being on call and leaving for a whole day and then coming back and having not slept is not ideal for me. Um, but I bond with couples in my classes and I can't say no to them and so I do it and it's amazing rich work and I, am, I learn every time I go, I just my mind gets blown. Um, on top of that, I also do birth trauma work and I was trained by Pam England to do that as well. Um, women come to me who have given birth and um, they are not happy with their birth experience. So maybe there was trauma involved, maybe there was something that was going to be wrong with the baby, maybe there was something wrong with the baby. It can also be women who wanted to give birth at home and they had to be transferred. Or even, it's all relative, the trauma is so relative, it could even be a woman who really didn't want the epidural and got it. And so now she has kind of a black cloud over her birth experience. So I'm trained to help work with women to see their birth in a more compassionate light. So I tell you all this because what that gives me is a viewpoint. I'm working with women in all different sides of this. So I see women in the preparation, the pregnancy. I see women during the birth. And then I see women afterwards in the aftermath. And I'm usually not seeing the same women for these things. I've never had somebody come to me for birth trauma who I've worked with previously. So I'm not seeing a continuous, but I'm seeing all these pieces of, okay, Here's what a woman is believing about birth, and then here's what happens in her birth. I see how all of it affects, affects each other. So, um, you know, it gives me sort of an interesting take. But um, I want to ask you guys a question. So who here, I just want to see, like, how familiar with birth you are. Who here has, has been to um, and witnessed in person a birth? Wow. Okay. Awesome. Um, who here has seen a birth on the internet? Okay, who here has never seen a, what a woman looks like when she's giving birth? Okay, that's helpful to know. Okay, cool. So let me just explain. You may already know this from some of the stuff you've been doing in class, but let me just, I'm going to give you the like dummies version of what birth is and what labor is because I think um, it's, it, can, it can be confusing. So labor is two things. It's the opening of the cervix, which is the bottom of the uterus where the baby is growing. Um, and if you take, so if you were to take like a two liter bottle of soda and turn it over, you've got that neck and then you've got how it rounds up like this. That's like the uterus and the neck is like the cervix. So what has to happen is that cervix is closed to keep the baby in. And in order for a baby to be born, that has to open to 10 centimeters-ish which is about the size of a bagel. Like, can you think of anything else your body does in which there's that much of a huge change that your body facilitates in that, in that way? I can't think of anything else. So it's, it's an intense experience. So you have to dilate, that's step one. Step two is baby has to come down and baby has to be pushed out. So that's what birth is. It's the opening and it's the pushing. And there's lots of things that go in there. So the other thing that's important to know about birth is just the basic things that make it happen. So the hormone of birth is called oxytocin. This is the hormone that starts this dilation and helps the baby move down, and it's, it's the hormone of birth. It's also the hormone of breastfeeding, and it's the hormone of sex. It is that feel-good, bonding, yummy, yummy hormone. So, okay, so that's one hormone. So let's just think back for a minute about um, ancient women giving birth. Interestingly enough, so much is different in our world. 
yet the mechanisms that allow us to give birth are exactly the same. So you can imagine, okay, let's say we've got an ancient woman and she's about to give birth and so she goes into a field and she's squatted down in the field and she's feeling pretty safe and she's in her groove, she's got her oxytocin flowing and she sees a, a tiger or a monkey, let's just say. An animal <laughs> of some kind that she maybe doesn't feel safe about is in her birth space. So something shifts within her. Adrenaline comes up. She has an adrenaline response. And that's a protective mechanism. So what that does is the blood goes away from the uterus and goes to her legs so that she can flee or possibly her arms so she can fight and labor stalls. And so she goes and she runs away and so she finds a, a safe place to give birth. And then labor can start again. So we don't give birth today with tigers in our birth space, but there are so many things that are possible in our birth space that can give the same adrenaline response. So these are fears. So in the work that I do, we refer to fears as our tigers. So the fear of, I don't want to poop in front of everybody, in front of strangers. You know, I mean, that's a real fear. Who here wants to poop in front of everybody, right? Okay, so that's a fear. Fear of, is my baby okay? Is something wrong? Fear of, might I, might I look messy? Might I not be prim and proper the way that I've been brought up to be my whole life? Um, I don't want a cesarean. What if I have to have a cesarean? What if the baby gets stuck? Um, who's that random person coming in the room? Um, is that a resident? You know, all of the, uh, the, the feeling of not feeling safe and private. So the same thing happens. That adrenaline response happens and a woman can have labor stalled. So the important thing to know there is that getting oxytocin to flow and to have adrenaline not pop up is the goal of anybody who's involved with helping labor. And there's about a million things that can get in the way of that. So um, I think since, you know, some of us have seen birth and some haven't, um, I think it's time for a contraction, so. Oh, oh. That one wasn't so bad. Oh. <laughs> <sighs> okay, so I show you that to show you that that is what a woman has to do in order to get her baby out. So it maybe makes it a little bit more real that, oh, if I choose an epidural, if I feel scared in labor, a woman has to go through this, has to be in this place while making these choices, and has to allow herself to dip down and be a mess, and be wild in labor, and make noises in front of people that she would never make, that society has told her not to make. We women are supposed to be kind of prim and proper, and you know, we don't poop and we don't fart and all this kind of stuff, and then on the one day it's like, oh, but yeah, on this day, you have to just be this mess. So it's no wonder our cesarean rate is so high. It's no wonder that birth has changed because who we are today, women today are actually quite masculine. You know, you, and so there's different degrees of it. But women today are walking around in a masculine way because we hold jobs, we have to be put together, we have to think very logically. So how do you prepare a woman 
in a logical mindset to then be able to do this and dip into this right brain to this creative place, this intuitive place. It's hard. And also, women are not wanting to, to see this. So you may see that there's birth classes advertised that are like, do you want a blissful birth? Do you want to not feel pain? And then you may see my classes advertised, which are, do you want to learn pain coping techniques for the intensity of labor and to help you know what to do when you don't know what to do? Everybody wants to take the other class because they want the pain-free birth. They don't want to have to be, I call this woman, mud woman. This is the part of us that is like from the dregs of the earth animal that has to rise up to push our baby out. Nobody wants to be her. Everybody wants to find the easier way out. So, um, you know, that's a little bit of my trick in my job is how do we get people who want to really look at what it might take to give birth. So, having said that, um, I want to talk to you about some, some of the things that make birth so complex. So, you know, you, everybody's already got their judgments about, you know, what's a good thing to do in birth, what's a bad thing to do in birth. Oh, that woman did, you know, X, Y, Z. Oh, that was a dumb move. Oh, if she wanted an intervention-free birth, shouldn't have gone to the hospital. Like, we all have our stuff about how we feel about that. So my, I come from a place of I'm not outcome-focused. The work I do, um, I don't think that there is a right way to give birth. Um, it's so hard for a woman to be in the fire of giving birth and to then later go back and judge herself a thousand ways in a society in which it's set up to go a certain way. So that's just kind of my, my background. But um, having said that, there are so many things in our control and out of our control that affect birth. So, um, and Ashley, will you, will you let me know when time, because I didn't bring my phone up here. So. Um, so things that affect uh, and, and add to the complexity of birth. So genetics. So what are the genes of the woman giving birth? Um, are births usually easy in her family? Does everybody have a giant head in her family? Does she have a small pelvis? Does she have a big pelvis? These things matter. Does she have a blood disorder? So genetics plays a role. Um, first birth story. Okay, so this sets the stage for how we feel about birth and what our agreements and our fears are about birth. So think back for yourself to the very first experience you ever had with birth. And think back to what that was. Maybe it was your sibling was born. Maybe it was a cousin was born. Maybe you had a dog that had puppies. Maybe you had a cat that had kittens. Maybe you saw a Saved by the Bell. Well, no way, that's way not your generation, right? I know nothing. Okay, yes, okay. So maybe you saw Saved by the Bell where there was a very special episode of somebody having a baby. I have no idea. Um, so think back to, if you can, that first experience with birth. And think about what that was. And if you had to ask yourself, what do I believe to be true about birth because of this first birth story experience? What might that be for you? So for some people, it's going to be, oh my gosh, when my brother was born, he had to be rushed to the NICU. It was super scary. I'm not giving, any, I'm not giving birth anywhere but in a hospital because if I, my baby needs that, I want to be near safety. Um, it may have been I saw, I saw my dog have puppies and it just looks so easy and natural. I feel like birth just happens. It's, it should be easy. So that's something to look at too is where are you coming from in thinking about birth? So when a woman is pregnant and has to choose where am I going to give birth? Who's going to be with me? Do I want to have interventions? Do I not? It's not so black and white. She's got this subconscious conditioning that's already happened to her. Um, a suitcase of agreements. So this is what do we think is right and wrong in birth. And these are usually agreements that are not our own. These are usually agreements that are passed down to us through family. Um, so we may feel a certain way about birth, but we may not have really ever thought about Okay, well, why do I feel that way? But we think either home birth is the safest or home birth is not the safest, whatever the, th the case may be. So the father or the partner's beliefs. This is one of the biggest factors in a woman's birth experience. Um, I've had people in my classes before the mom says, I want to do a home birth. I feel like that's where I'll feel the safest. The oxytocin will be able to flow in the comfort of my own home. And the dad says, there is no way I am scared shitless that something is going to happen to our baby. So what do you do with that? So in many cases, the woman will say, well, I want to have his support. I don't want him to be freaked out. So I guess we'll just do it at the hospital, and I'll just do my best to try to do it how I want to do it there. 
So um, the partners have a huge effect. Um, being introverted or being extroverted. So how might an introvert come at birth differently than an extrovert? If an introvert is maybe not as willing to have a conversation with people about it, maybe not as open to having a line of dialogue with their care provider, how might that be different? So personality type, I mean, this is, this is such an interesting piece to me. There's a saying in birth that is, you birth how you live. And it's true. So somebody who's a type A personality does not all of a sudden get pregnant and go, oh, I'm just going to flow and be submissive and whatever. That type A person has a type A pregnancy, and that's just how, how it works. So again, we ask, why are women choosing what they're choosing? Well, what is their personality type like? It's not so black and white. Um, another personality type you know, if you've got somebody who's prim and proper and all put together, always makeup, always hair done, everything, is that woman going to want to do what I did in front of a bunch of strangers? Maybe not, right? So when we look at why labors get stalled, why is the cesarean rate so high? It partially has nothing to do with birth, but it has things to do with how, how we are as a society. Um, finances. Sadly, this is one of the top reasons why people choose to birth in different places. So who your insurance has um, a contract with is who you're going to choose. So I have women, I'm, so I live down in Orange County and I have women all the time say, you know, well, so what's a doctor, you know, that, that delivers at this hospital that's more natural friendly or is more respectful or whatever. And so sometimes there isn't a doctor and yet they still choose to give birth there because they don't have the money to pay out of pocket. Um, to do a birth center. And for some women, it becomes a priority. And I know there was a woman in Colorado um, who did like a GoFundMe for her home birth because she really wanted it and, or, or some, you know, some sort of thing where you uh, raise money. And so for some people, it becomes a priority. And for some people, it isn't. And we can, I mean, we all understand financial struggle in some way. We can understand why a woman would say, I'm not going to spend $5,000 out of my pocket. I'm just going to try to do the best I can in the hospital because that's what my insurance has. We have compassion for that um, because we, you know, that's, that's a, finances can be a tricky thing. Um, history of successes and failures. So in this person's life, has everything happened to them easily or have they failed here and there? Have, basically, has this person ever been humbled? So you take a perfectionist personality type and you take them and they're pregnant and now what does their pregnancy look like? What are their options? What are they allowing themselves to choose and not choose? Um, a chosen prenatal care model. Goodness, this is another one of those ones that has so much effect, which is what do your care providers believe about birth? What and the possibilities of birth? Um, the hospital where you're birthing at, what are some of the protocols that they have set up? Some hospitals have something that's called their baby friendly certified, which means that the baby does not leave your side. They do any of the things right in the room there with you. Um, so you know that they're cognizant about the fact that a mother and a baby want and need to be together as, as much as can be possible. So, um, you know, are you birthing at a hospital where baby friendly is not part of it? And, you know, I've I've attended births at baby-friendly hospitals that still aren't baby-friendly because you have human beings working within a system, right? So as much as somebody can say, oh, this doctor is wonderful or whatever, you get somebody on a bad day, you get a nurse that, you know, likes something, doesn't like something, and it can change it. So not only is the chosen prenatal care model important, but the care provider within that. So what has the nurse that's on shift when you're having your baby, what kind of, what did she just come from? Did her husband just leave her? Did her daughter just go away to college and she's, her mind's somewhere else? Did they lose a baby last week at that hospital? Was it a similar situation in what's going on with your birth? There are so many things that affect that and you have all of these different energies that come into the room and all the things that they bring with them. What do they believe is possible in birth? What are their um, agendas? And then you've got the system in which they work in. You can see how when a woman goes to give birth and she has her birth plan and she thinks, I want to do this all natural, it's like all the things that come in to stop that, it's, 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 um, it can be a tricky thing. Now, having said that, it can also be that a woman comes in thinking, I want that epidural, I don't care, just, you know, I don't want to feel any of this. And she could come in with a nurse who's very natural friendly, who helps push her and support her. So it can go both ways. It's just to say that... Um, birth in our culture uh, is it's it's not a black and white sort of thing um, 
Mm, another one is social media glimpses. Now, this is something that when I was pregnant with my son, so he's eight and a half, I have a two-year-old and an eight and a half-year-old, we didn't really have social media back then. So I wasn't reading about every study about every terrible thing that's going to happen to you or why certain things are better than others. But these days, you get inundated with everything. So a pregnant woman, what is she seeing on Facebook? What is she seeing on social media? Is she seeing her friend who had a home birth post all the blissful photos but not talking about how hard it really was? Is she seeing, um, you know, what, what's realistic and what's not? So that, that definitely uh, has an effect. The labor environment, um, at being at a hospital, you know, how is that different than, uh, than being, at, being at home or being at a birthing center? So another one is fertility or ease of conception. So when you have somebody who has had a hard time getting pregnant and then they become pregnant finally and then they're going to give birth, they have a different flavor, which is most of the time they trust medical providers adamantly because that's who helped them conceive and get pregnant. So th it's harder for them to question things and they also kind of, rightfully so, but they had their power taken away. The thing that they not are supposed to be able to do because we're not guaranteed anything, but the thing that seems, oh, I should have been able to get pregnant, they weren't able to do. So I worked with clients before who there is definitely a seed in their head of, I might not be able to give birth to this baby vaginally because I couldn't get pregnant, so I probably can't birth either. So that's just something to know, too. Um, another thing is pregnancy losses. Um, these sweet souls, these people who've been through a devastating pregnancy loss, have a completely different viewpoint of their options and pregnancy. Their innocence was taken from them, and they are not able to connect as easily to the magical parts, the trusting parts of birth. Um, and rightfully so. So then you look at, okay, well, somebody like that may be more apt to go for the cesarean than to push it and, and, and wait a little bit longer. Um, oh, gosh, there's so many different things. Um, another part of it, the, the last one that I'll mention, um, is in my work we call it the birth fairy. And it's just this hokey sort of representation of the things in labor in which you cannot control. So you don't know when you wake up, the morning that you're going to give birth, the night that you're going to give birth, what is your baby's positioning? And sure, there's certain things you can do to stack the deck in your favor for that. There's, you can stack the deck in your favor for a million different things, and that's part of what childbirth preparation is, stacking the deck. But at the end of the day, you cannot change if your baby is positioned in a way that creates um, more intensity in your labor. I had a friend who, uh, she has two kids, and she was having her third, and she'd gone in the hospital, uh, epidural-free, done it completely natural with the first two, and with the third, when she went into labor, she was in the middle of a cold and had been coughing for like two days and not sleeping. She got the epidural, right? And could you blame her? No. Um, at least I couldn't blame her. So uh, this is another thing, is that you don't know what the birth fairy is going to throw at you. When, and we have this like little hokey puppet thing that we show that's like on the day that you give birth, is she going to sprinkle a little bit of dust or is she going to dump on you? You don't know. So these are things that are out of, out of your control. Um, and the one thing that is probably the most um, influential is coworkers' stories and beliefs about birth and your family's stories and beliefs about birth that are being passed down to you. This is like the social conditioning. This is a hypnosis that you don't even know you're taking part in. But if you have family members who've given birth and you hear their, their stories over and over again, you start to believe that's what birth must be like. And so you can imagine somebody going to work during their pregnancy, and if there's other people who've had, who've had kids there, maybe somebody says, you have to go natural. It's the only way to go. I felt so amazing afterwards. I felt so powerful. You've got to do it. So that woman then thinks, okay, this is the way I must do it. And then you have somebody else who's going, just get the epidural, save yourself, you don't have to be the hero. And you think, okay, I have to do that. So there's a lot um, that can be dumped on pregnant people. So this is just to say it's a lot. It can make your head spin. And so a woman going into birth and going, okay, do I want the IV? Do I not want the IV? Do I want to give birth at a hospital? Do I not? All of this is in play there. So it's not going to be, um, so I guess basically if we hand a woman a study that says studies show that home birth is safe for low-risk women, great. 
what about all of these other things? That doesn't touch all of those other things. So, you know, then we ask ourselves, okay, so why does this matter? Why is it helpful to know that these choices in birth are complex and affected by lots of different things? Um, for one, it hopefully gives us some compassion towards any woman, any couple walking into birth. Birth is a rite of passage, it is an ordeal, and it requires that you step into the unknown. You don't know if you're going to die. You don't know if your baby's going to die. And I mean, really, life is stepping into the unknown. None of us know this. None of us know when we walk out of here what's going to happen. But birth is an intensity physically and emotionally. So when you think about it this way, when a baby is born, a mother and a father, or a mother and a mother, however, however the case may be, are born. So a part of them dies. There is a death in that room of who these people were before they had this baby. And when they emerge, they're new, just like this newborn baby. And that's a big deal, right? So when you think about it, you think about, and when, well, when I think about it, the only other two experiences in life that I think even touch it are our own birth, which we don't consciously remember, and then our own death, which there's not much information about that because we can't tell everybody about that, right? So giving birth, having a human being be born through you is the most intense experience. It is otherworldly. So having compassion for what people are doing during that time I think is an important thing. Compassion is the opposite of judgment. So you can imagine why women choose what they choose. Women choose what they think is safest, and what they think is safest is based on all of these things we talked about. And you can understand why women may not want to stick their neck out when they're pregnant and s do something out of the box. Why they might not want to fight the system. It makes sense. But the beauty is, is that birth and this transition, this rite of passage, also invokes in us a chance to to do some personal growth. We all of a sudden are asking questions we never asked before. All of a sudden we are not the most important thing in our lives and we have to sort of go, oh, okay, well, so what do I want out of this? And some people explore that a little bit and some people explore it a lot. So it really does open up the chance for, for us to um, change as human beings, to completely shift. So you may notice that you have friends who, um, or people that you know, family members, who were one way, and then by the time they had their baby, were like a complete way. A lot of people find their inner hippie when they get pregnant. I know I did, and it was shocking to me. Um, and, and vice versa, too. I also had a birth experience, and when my hippie self had to take a back seat, and I had to become somebody who was in a medical model. So I know both of those worlds, and the flexibility that that requires is an important skill that um, would help a lot of us uh, giving birth today. So compassion, that's why it's important to know. Hopefully it gives us some compassion. Um, hopefully, too, it helps us understand why people may choose what they choose. And maybe even more importantly is that it's none of our damn business why people choose what they choose. So I say that with a grain of salt because I also know it is our business because we're studying it. But really, when a woman tells you, if a woman ever tells you her birth story or a man tells you their birth story, let me just say that is not your opportunity to have any opinion about it. So I'm, I'm so excited to be telling you at this age because you guys have probably not been around this a lot, but I can't tell you how many women come, women come to me traumatized because they open up and share their story and they maybe even say, oh yeah, I wished I hadn't got the epidural, but it was so painful and I didn't, I didn't realize it was gonna be like that and oh man, I'd been in labor for 20 hours and I hadn't slept. And then somebody who is uninitiated, I mean, I've done it, like we all do this stuff all the time, you know, would maybe say something like, oh, well, yeah, but did you know that the epidural can affect the baby? Like, none of that needs to exist. So that's just derail, side note there. Um, so, so here's another thing that's important to know, is that because all of these things exist, maybe giving women information is not the most helpful way to help crack them open, to help spur this personal growth. Um, so you can imagine uh, having a dialogue with a woman, asking a woman who's pregnant, well, so what do you believe to be true about birth? 
that could elicit many things. One of the things that could happen is the woman could go, oh, well, I believe I would never give birth at home because it's only safest to do it in a hospital because my brother, when he was born, he wasn't breathing and they needed to take him to the NICU and I would never, I don't want to lose my baby. I would never do that. And if a person can just not speak for a moment and not interject what they think should happen, what may happen is a woman may say, but it's interesting because I have a friend who gave birth at home and that was okay. So maybe I don't know. That like, I know I'm the only one here, but that like gives me goosebumps to think that if we just give the space for women to do some of their processing without us interjecting information at them, they may come to their own realizations that maybe I should look at some other stuff. So this is just to say that handing women studies doesn't touch all of the stuff that we've done. We have to talk about the complexities the foundations that are below that, and that's in the, in the birthing class work that I do, that's what I do. I'm trained to see these different things brewing underneath them, and I am trained to ask them questions to help empower them to find their own resources so that I'm not the expert, but they become their own expert, because in labor, that's really what matters. You want women to become their own resource and not look outside, but look within themselves. Um, Okay, so a couple things. I'm going to give you um, a couple stories that kind of illustrate some of these things. Um, let's see, who am I going to tell you first? Okay, so one of my uh, doula clients was a woman named, I'm going to call her Sarah. So um, Sarah had struggled with infertility, her and her husband, and she had had a miscarriage. So a miscarriage is a devastating thing um, to anybody, and like we talked about, that kind of colors things a little bit differently. So. You know, people who have had a miscarriage, their goal becomes, I need an alive, I want an alive baby. That's their goal. As, and it's not that that's not the goal for other people, but it just that becomes, I don't necessarily care how it happens. I just don't ever want to feel this loss ever again. Gosh, so much compassion for that. That makes total sense. So Sarah's pregnant, and um, she's nearing the end of her pregnancy. And she starts to feel like something might not be right with the baby. So she was planning to give birth at a hospital. She didn't want to do pain meds, wanted to be intervention-free as possible. Um, and uh, so she starts feeling like maybe something's not right with the baby. She's not feeling the baby move as much as she, she thinks the baby should. So this is one of those moments when being a pregnant person, you have no idea that happens to every person who's been pregnant. You think is something wrong with the baby. It's not moving or it is moving, or, or whatever the thing is. And this is where your personality type comes in. So a mellow, sort of right-brained kind of person would maybe just be like, ah, everything's good. I'm not going to worry. Worry, you know, I don't want worry to affect me in labor, in my pregnancy. But then if you get somebody who's more of a type A, they may go, well, I'm going to go see my doctor. So Sarah just, she just kept having this, like, gut intuition that something wasn't right. So. We talked, and she said, you know, I'm, I'm just going to go see my doctor and just go get hooked up to the monitor that, me that checks the baby's heart tones. So she goes, and the heart tones are fine, but then Sarah goes to stand up while she's got the, um, the monitors on her, and the baby's heart rate plummets. And so they think, okay, well, this is concerning. But another thing that we know is when you look inside the environment with heart monitors on babies is one thing like that does not constitute like, okay, we're going to now change everything. So you're just getting a little peek. So, so they keep her on the monitor for a while. Baby's heart rate comes back up, is doing okay, and then she goes to stand up again, and the same thing, it plummets to, like, dangerous levels. So they monitor her. She sends me a text that says, you know, we're just going to see how this is going, but they might want to do a cesarean if this doesn't get better and get the baby out because there may be a cord issue. So um, she texts me back about um, 30 minutes later, and it keeps happening, and the baby's having a harder time getting the heart rate back up. So they're suspecting that the cord is down low so that when she stands up, gravity pushes on it, the baby's head pushes on the cord, and it's like a kink in a hose, um, which is not good. So I, I get over to the hospital, and so she's going to give birth to her baby by cesarean. So I get there, and then after the baby's born and everything, I was really impressed because for many women who <coughs> especially want an intervention-free birth, to have a cesarean is a really hard thing to process, especially while processing becoming a mother and the physicality. I mean, she's just been through surgery, right? That's a big deal. Um, but what I thought was interesting is that she had a really pretty 
whole take on the whole thing, A, because of her background of having a loss, and B, because it was her intuition that guided this. It wasn't that she was all fine and a doctor said, oh, looks like baby's not doing good, but she was, it came from her. So I tell you this story to illustrate that, you know, at the end of this, we could look at her birth and say, well, okay, had she not gone in to see her doctor, maybe everything would have been fine. Maybe there would have been a position change. Maybe she would have given birth to her baby intervention-free and vaginally and all of that stuff. And if we hadn't known, it would have been fine. But the other side of it is maybe she listened to her intuition and maybe she saved her baby's life. The real takeaway is here is that we don't know. So birth is mysterious. We don't have all the answers. After it happens, you can't say, oh, I knew we should have done this or we shouldn't have done this. You don't know, and that's what makes it complex and hard. Um, so another uh, story that I will share with you is um, I had a client, and I'll call her Amy. So Amy was a scientist, first time mom, uh, a scientist. So she kind of knew about science and about giving her body the best chance to uh, have a straightforward birth. So she was going to give birth at a hospital, but she also knew, okay, if I can't take this because she said, I don't know how I do with pain, um, you know, I'm also okay to having the epidural. It's like, okay. So we get to the hospital. She's in the thick of labor. She's, um, but she's coping wonderfully and she's moving along. And her and her husband are really jokey. They're, they're hilarious, but um, they're really, and the husband is like super jokey, really lighthearted. She ended up having her mom and dad in the room and even a sister, and everybody was cracking all these jokes. It was really lively. And then there's a moment in labor in which things, she gets into active labor in which she goes from dilating and it's going from here to now this, right? It's getting bigger. It's more intense. The hormones of labor actually pull you out of being in the world and you dig down to that mud woman place where you have to go within. So it's one of the beauties of how our body works is that we call it labor land. It takes a woman to labor land where she's not quite with it. But it's a good thing because she has to go there in order to do, to do this opening work. So things in the room start to get serious. She's starting to have to moan uh, through contractions, really breathe through them. So the, the mood kind of shifts, but as it should, right? So at some point, she's chugging along, doing OK, and she says to me, I really think I want the epidural. I don't think I can do this anymore. And so I know, I mean, I know that any woman in labor is, looks for a way out at some point. We all do. I gave birth to my son at home, and I wanted the epidural that was non-existent. Like, we all want it. So I know that when a woman says that, I know that it's par for the course. It's almost like I want to say to her, ah, welcome. You've arrived at labor because you want out of it. That means you're in it. <laughs> um, so, but what I also know is that um, it's helpful to support a woman and to help her get through those moments because they, they come and they go. So, um, so she says that she thinks she wants the epidural. And so we say, okay, well, let's see. Let's get five more minutes. Let's see how we can get through these, you know. And so she's doing all right. Uh, so at some point she goes into the bathroom during a contraction and her husband follows her. And so her husband, he's not in the bathroom for like 15 seconds. So he goes in with her and he comes out and he goes, we want the epidural, Where do, where's the paperwork, where do we sign? And in my mind I'm knowing that sometimes it's actually the partner that wants the woman to get the epidural. Because it is hard to watch somebody you love get serious. Make noises you've never seen them make in that context before. Um, you know, it, it's, so I, so this is where I think one of you asked me um, on the questions if I ever felt overwhelmed. And this wasn't necessarily overwhelming, but this is where my job is the trickiest job some days I feel like on what to do. You know, how do you support this? So, so I said to him, well, when she came out of the bathroom, I, of course, validated her. You know, you are in the thick of labor, and I know you want the epidural, and you're doing amazing how can we support you better? You know, let's talk about that. And I said, and the other thing is, is how about we get some information to help base your choice on? So if a nurse comes in and checks you and says that you are close to pushing, let's say, so 10 is complete before you can be pushing. So let's say you're at an eight or a nine. Might you not get the epidural because you're really close to being, being done? And she said, yeah, that would change if I got the epidural or not. So I said, okay, well then maybe we should have you checked if that's gonna change your your answer. So we go get the nurse and the nurse comes in and she's still at the same place she had been before she hadn't progressed, which is normal. Labor doesn't just go in a tick, 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 easy pattern. Um, so she decides that she wants to get the epidural. 
Um, and so the tricky part here is that I know that getting the epidural can derail things. I know that it can switch the body kind of off. But what I'm more thinking about and worrying is, is that I want her to make this choice from her own place. Because I know from the birth trauma work I do is when a choice is made in really quickly, uh, women later go, oh, why didn't somebody just keep pushing me? Why didn't they keep supporting me? In hindsight, you can look back and say, you know, um, oh, I, had, uh, I only had two more hours to go. I could have totally done it. But when you're in the moment, you don't know how long you've got. You may have a whole day. You have no idea. So I felt, I felt good about the fact that she made her choice based on information because I knew even afterwards, if, and really I mean when, she starts to judge herself for her choices in labor because this is just a thing we all do, that she at least could feel justified knowing where she was. If she had gone, well, I didn't even know where I was, I could have been really close. She may have come out with some wounding and some negative self-agreement. So that's, again, this whole thing, there's a gray area. And my job on when to support something, I mean, I su I'll support anything. My goal is to have a woman come through feeling supported. And if that means she goes in there and says, I want the scheduled cesarean, I want all the stuff, give me all the narcotics in the world, great. I'm, I'll ask her a thousand questions before we get to that. Uh, in order to help her, you know, do you understand the risks of what can happen to the baby? You know, what do you, all those kinds of things. Um, but I'll, I'll support whatever because I want women at the end of the day, I want them to feel whole about their experience. I want them to feel like they had a say in it. Um, and I want them to feel like they had the resources that they needed to make the decisions. Having said that, there is always a moment in labor in which you don't know what to do and in which something is taken from you that you did not expect to have <laughs> taken from you. Um, so one last story that I'll tell you is my own, one of my own stories. And it's actually the least dramatic story, but I feel like it kind of illustrates some of this stuff a little bit better. So when I was pregnant with my son about nine years ago, um, I was a total planner. And I think like the minute I found out I was pregnant, I went to Barnes and Noble and bought all the books about all the different ways to give birth and everything. So, um, and I went on hospital tours like way early in which I had no belly and I looked pretty young for my age. So I think people thought I was doing like a high school project. It was a whole thing. <laughs> um, yeah, looking back, I'm like, what did people think of me? It was just pretty funny. but. Um, so um, I had just actually, uh, my, my best friend had given birth about a year earlier and had a home birth, and she had invited me to it to help support her, which was crazy because I had never done that before, but she liked me enough that she thought I could help her. So I had witnessed this beautiful home birth where everything was beautiful and serene and straightforward, not to say it wasn't hard as hell for her to do the work, but, you know, from the outside, it's like, this is gorgeous. Um, but having experienced that, all of my social conditioning and things, I felt like, well, I want to give birth at a hospital because you get the little name tags that say the baby's name and the baby blankets. I honestly think that is all from Cabbage Patch Kids, by the way. <laughs> um, I know that this is probably not your generation, but when I was a kid, Cabbage Patch Kids were huge, and there was this place called Babyland Hospital USA that I like dreamed of going to, in which all the dolls lived in like these incubators. Like it's the most disgusting sort of thing now when I think about it. But so I had this romantic view of the hospital. So I thought, well, that's where I want to give birth. Like my friend Mary, she had her birth. That's great, but I'm going to do it this way. So I started interviewing OBs. And so even wanting to be in a hospital, I still wanted to do it. I didn't want to have as, I didn't want to have interventions. I wanted to try to do it naturally. So I start interviewing OBs and I find out that, wow, OBs are not, the ones I was meeting with are not really on board with some of the things that I want to be on board with. So I would, I would say things like, you know, I'm really looking to go, uh, my friend who had the home birth gave me like a list of questions to grill them. And one of them is, is like, how do you support a natural birth? And so one woman said to me, um, oh, well, if you need the epidural, we're going to give you the epidural. And so in my mind, I'm going, oh, shit. Birthing in a hospital is not going to work for me because this is, the, this is kind of the protocol and I'm not willing to interview like 20 OBs. So I start to go, okay, well something has to change. So I kind of say goodbye to that dream and I think about a birthing center and I think, well, perfect because it's still like Babyland Hospital and because it's like a place that I go to, but then it's, it's like my home. And so then we decide that we're going to give birth at a birthing center and that feels really good. So, and I would, lived in Santa Monica at the time, but the closest birthing center was in Orange County. So even though it was far, I was just 
whatever that sound was. Like. I guess my thing was, well, if I'm in labor in the car, that means it's fast. So I was like looking at the bright side of things. Um, so a couple months before I'm about to give birth, I take a birthing from within class like I now teach, which spurred me to teach it, and it blew my mind. It opened me up to all my agreements about birth and where I felt safe and where I didn't feel safe and all of these things. And I started to realize, among many other things, uh, that I was trying to bring all the things, all the things that made me feel safe and yummy and like I, strong, like I could birth, were all at my home and I was going to haul all of those things to a birthing center. So I had to check my agreements about what am I resisting here with a home birth. So at the end of the day, I just, we, we decided we were going to give birth at home. So we've gone like all across the gamut, right? So then I'm like, home birth, yes, I can do this. And then I go to see my midwife about a month before my son's due, and he's breech. So then, and like I said, breech, you cannot give uh, birth to in hospitals, most of them. There was one hospital out here with some old OB that would do it but required forceps. It was like, there was like some caveat or something. So I'm doing all the things to try to, to try to turn him. I'm in a bathtub. I'm in a swimming pool. I'm doing headstands. I'm doing acupuncture. I'm doing moxibustion. I'm doing everything. And I'm also then preparing for what might a cesarean birth look like. And I'll tell you, from somebody who's planning a home birth to then go to a cesarean birth, it's not an easy place to be. So by some stroke of luck and just stars aligning, my midwife says to me, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to massage, I'm going to oil up your belly and we're going to try to move him manually move him. So this is something doctors also do. It's called aversion. They also do it in a, a hospital, but they usually have an OR waiting in case things go wrong and they have to immediately do something. So I was pretty open to it. I have a massage therapy background as well, so I was like, fine. And at this point, I was willing to do anything to get this baby to turn. So it worked, which it doesn't always work, but it worked. And I wanted to stand. I didn't want to sleep. I didn't want to lay down. I wanted to just have him be down for the rest of the pregnancy. So we had a couple bumps in the road. And, um, but, uh, but we ended up, everything towards the end went smooth and straightforward as it can be. But I will tell you, there was a moment I had in labor where I remember I was in transition. So transition is the place where you get complete and you start feeling like you want to push. It's the most intense feeling in the world. And it's usually the shortest part of labor because it's so intense. This is the place, we call it the gate of great doubt. This is the place where women usually want out. They don't want to do it anymore. They're crying. This is just where everybody's a mess. Um, but like I said, you usually get over the hump for this so you can, you can um, sort of support people through this. But I remember in my house looking at myself in my bathroom mirror, and I was thinking, pardon my language, when the fuck did I become this hippie? I am this tree hugger. I want to be in that hospital. I want to get that epidural. And then I all of a sudden turned it on my friend Mary, who was now at my birth. I was like, she lied to me. This is not beautiful. This is hard. And then it was gone because then I was the next contraction came and you just have to be with the next thing that you're doing. So I tell you my story uh, to illustrate how birth can lay a foundation for us to do some self-work. So I went from, I want to have this birth in a hospital that's really romantic, which probably doesn't exist, to I'm OK with birthing at home. So we all have our different levels of how much we want to look at things, how much we want to let ourselves shift. And so some people do a little bit of it. Some people do a lot of it. So that's just to kind of tell you again, it's complex. Things shift, things change. All of these things that are in play can be assessed, can be changed. So, you know, it's not, it's not sort of a black or white thing. So that's what I came here to tell you guys. Um, you know, I, I learn from every birth I go to, every couple I work with. And funny enough, the more that I do, I feel like the less I know. Because I can think something, oh, this works, or oh, women shouldn't try this. And then I'm at a birth where they do it, and it works brilliantly. I'm like, Phew, what do I know? I know nothing, pretty much, is what I know. Every birth is new and different, and nothing makes any sense. So having said that, um, I want to um, open up the floor for uh, questions. I know you guys submitted a bunch of really awesome questions, and I'm sorry I didn't answer many, if any, of those questions. Um, I wanted to really spend this time telling you some personal stories and, and things. So please feel free to ask anything.
So um, if you just raise your hand, I'll come and uh, give you the mic because we're, uh, we're filming this, so we want to get it recorded. Um, it won't actually amplify you, but um, so just raise your hand and I'll come and give it to you. Oh, over here? Okay. Have you ever dealt with cases of people who have experienced uh, SIDS baby? No, not firsthand, thankfully. Yeah, that's a treacherous, a treacherous place to be. He asked if um, I had ever dealt with clients who had uh, a baby die from SIDS, and I have not. Hi, Hi. I'm Edgar. I just want to say thank you for coming and spending some time with us. It's Thanks. been uh, very informative. I have one, well, I have a few questions, but I just wanted to know, is there something that you feel can be done to make women more aware of their birthing options? Mm. Uh, the short answer to that is um, be, having them be told about their birth options. So this is, I mean, so there's not like a, let's go and do X, Y, Z. This is all those things I talked about. So the stories that we tell, um, the social media glimpses, um, all of these things need to change. And like what you were, I think maybe Ashley, you even talked about it, is there is a shift going on in which women are requesting um, more natural, more, more, more options, really, to be honest. And so the, the conversation is changing, but this just has to become part of the mainstream. But I think the biggest factor that would affect that is insurance. If insurance has covered uh, birth center births and midwives, the, they, that would be part of their options, and I think so many more women would would uh, would choose them. Yeah, I think I think insurance is the biggest one. Yeah, what's your next? What one? type of insurance covers that? Is it a PPO or HMO or? Uh, it's a, so none. None. It's oh, none. Geez. So this is so this is the thing: is if you want to give birth at home, you pay out of your pocket, unless there's some like crazy awesome PPOs in which you can submit claims to, and they'll pay a certain portion. I think maybe for my son, maybe we got some reimbursement back. But no, that was an out-of-a-pocket thing. Birthing centers, so when I lived in Colorado, there was a birthing center that actually did take some insurance, but it's at a different contracted rate, um, so it wasn't like it was just free. Um, like, or, you know, just meet your deductible. But once that shifts, I think that that opens the door. And really, what the studies are showing and what the consumers, really, more importantly almost, is what the consumers are requesting is they're looking for births that are more natural in a hospital setting or going to birthing centers. And, you know, the medical establishment money talks. So once the money goes somewhere different, they're forced to change something. A hospital down near where I live in Irvine, uh, one of their OB practices uh, just added a nurse midwife to their team because people kept coming to them going, yeah, but do you guys have any midwifery care within your thing? And so they're like, we have these people coming to us with dollars who want this kind of care. We have to provide it. So there's a midwife that will attend births now in a hospital. So you can have a hospital birth covered by insurance if your insurance covers that hospital with a midwife. And what's amazing is the way that she attends births and the way that the nurses and everything is set up for births that she attends completely different than the other OBs. She says, I don't want any monitors on people. I don't want any IVs on people. I don't want them to be checked every two hours. And that has to fly because she's contracted with them, whereas the OBs, they do everything differently. So it affects things hugely. Yeah. Good question. Thank you. Um, do you have any advice for somebody that would want to become a doula or like a midwife? Hmm. Advice for somebody who wants to become a doula or a midwife. Um, there's so many different ways that you can get involved. Um, and especially if you're not certified yet, I think this was one of the other questions somebody submitted, is um, there are groups on Facebook, there's other groups too, in which there are people looking for labor support who um, cannot afford it. And so they'll take somebody who isn't as... Um, skilled or trained uh, to come support them. But I would start reading books. Birthing from Within would be, of course, top of my list. I think it's amazing. Um, the new rewrite of the book is coming out at the beginning of next year. Um, just start to get in touch with there's um, certifying agencies for doula work. There's one called Kappa. There's one called Dona. Birthing from Within certifies as well. 
um, just start to reach out to some of these groups, do some searching online, and you'll find that the doula community and the birth work community is we're all women trying to help other families and we're a welcoming, welcoming bunch. So even if you found a group and was like, hey, I'm a student, I wanna learn more about this, people will be like, do you wanna come check out one of my classes I'm teaching? I can use an assistant, do you wanna do? So it's a really welcoming, warm community. So just, just getting out there. Thank you. Yes. Who, um, who is and who is not a good candidate for home birth? Hmm. So she's asking who is and who is not a good candidate for home birth. So this is where this is kind of out of my scope because I'm a doula, I'm non-medical. So I, so, but I can tell you like personally, you know, um, oh, that's such a fine line because one doctor can see a woman and go, okay, so she's got gestational diabetes, but we're, it's being managed that's okay. And another provider can say, oh, well, I would, you never know. She could have a giant baby. It could be, it could have problems when it's born. So it's a relative thing. But I mean, it's somebody who doesn't have issues going on. Um, so we call her, we call somebody like that low risk. Um, I'm trying to think of some specifics, but like I said, there's, there's a ton of gray area. So um, I think now there's more care providers that do twins, but sometimes twins will risk you out. Um, certain health conditions. Um, this is another one where some do, some don't. Having had a cesarean and trying to go for a vaginal birth after cesarean, some home birth midwives will not take you. Um, yeah, that's the short answer. I'm sorry. But that's a good, good thing to Google because there's a ton of that kind of information. Especially if you go to like a birthing center website. Yeah. Okay, my question is, what made you want to become a uh, doula and, mm. you know, help women with, you know, their trauma with after yeah. um, Good question. So she's asking, what made me want to become a doula or help women with their trauma? Um, becoming a mom has just been, I, I can't even, there's no words for it. Um, going through the process of giving, being pregnant, all the things that are thrown at you, giving birth, then becoming a new mom, you, I just, I feel like, I'm a whole new person. When my son was born, I cracked open and died. And this new me had to put pieces back together and figure out, oh, well, that piece that I used to be, that doesn't really serve me in this life, but I like this piece, so I'm gonna pick this up. Okay, but along this way. So as I did that, and, and when you become part of a club of people who've had babies, you just wanna help everybody else, and you wanna help everybody feel, well, I guess I'm, this is just me. Maybe not everybody feels this way. Um, and so I felt like that I had had such great support and my classes had really changed my life, not just for birth, but some of the th theories that we learned in there and the things that we did, just I, I, I thought about years after, not even in relation to birth. So I felt like I wanna be able to, to provide other people with this. And then being able to be there with somebody in labor after having gone through it myself and knowing what it feels like um, is, I just felt a huge calling to do that. Um, like I said, it's the hard part about it is, is I love that work because I feel like I'm well suited to work with people in really intense moments. But it's also really hard as the provider because you're in these moments that are shaping these people's lives in a huge way. And it's hard to not feel like you're walking on eggshells. So I love the doula aspect of the work and it's also terrifying to be honest with you. Both of those things to, to be, in a, to be in these imprinting situations um, and to say the right thing, to help in the right way, it's tough stuff, but it's so rich. As, I mean, honestly, anything in life that's super enriching is also terrifying, so it fits. <laughs> Last question, where yeah. would someone find like services, or will, how can someone find a doula? So where would, where would they go? Where so, um, just if we're talking computer, just doing a Google search, this area, doula. Um, I know on Birthing From Within, you can search for doulas specifically. Um, on Kappa, these are the certifying organizations. Dona, you can, you can uh, search for doulas in your area. But every doula 
midwife has almost has a website so you just google you can ask um, you know referrals are always a good thing but just really meeting with these people to see who's a good fit for you but um, they're really pretty accessible once you know if you just if you do a quick search and kind of open your eyes to that whole birth world it's big <laughs> okay sorry last question yeah. so mm -hmm. do you uh, before the pregnancy start getting familiar with the woman you're helping or get personal with them to get them com like comfortable with before you? they're pregnant yeah so not no How not necessarily because people come to me usually when they're pregnant sometimes um, you know I do some fertility sort of ah, I don't even know what I'd call it um, some fertility work with people not like hands-on but more like talking kind of stuff because um, that's a realm I understand too uh, but no, I usually see people once they're pregnant. And really, so this is the thing too, in this day and age, we overthink everything, right? We think if we can outthink it and we can Google it, even though I just told you to Google something, um, we think we can get what we want. So I'm actually like thinking about all of this too much is also not a good thing. So where's that fine balance? Right. It's different for everybody, I don't know. I think we have time for one more, and I saw your hand, so I'm Um, so I had like a lot of like misconceptions about birth growing up mm -hmm. and you know like you said a lot of stories you know yeah. I kind of like was scared of certain things so yeah. I was always told that if you have a, a c-section you can never give birth vaginally after that um, why is that and, and then I and then I, I read and learned that you can and I've you know I've heard of women who've given birth vaginally after yes. a cesarean I thought that was impossible yeah um, no. so what I mean, what, what, why would someone say that? Like, why would someone say you can't give birth vaginally after? So there is, so, and this is, again, not in my total realm because this is more of the medical, okay. the medical stuff. But what I will say is that, um, you know, there is a, a slight risk of a uterine rupture or a tear okay. um, because it had been opened and stitched back. Um, it's low, but so it's a cover your ass sort of thing yeah. for doctors. Um, and, and women weren't really demanding it. It was, it was easy enough to kind of say, oh no, you can't do this. And you know, think about it, if you're a woman who gives birth by cesarean, you may think birth is scary and you may be under the mindset that your cesarean saved your baby's life. But, so getting somebody who's had a cesarean to do a repeat cesarean may not be a hard thing. But now that we know different and we know better and women go and do it all the time and have successes, now people are wanting something mm -hmm. different. So um, I'm, it's great that you, have checked your agreements and that you can even I mean honestly that you can even verbalize I had a lot of misconceptions about birth like bravo to you that's huge how many pregnant women d don't even know they have misconceptions about birth so um, mm -hmm. the fact that you're digging and asking questions and able to realize that is is really really huge yeah, yeah. I, I love learning about birth <laughs> yeah awesome. um, one more quick thing yeah. I've read that um, the same kind of effect uh, as far as like social conditioning mm -hmm. happens when uh, in breastfeeding, but it's different in like in the U.S. specifically. It's yeah. different in like each state. So like I learned that like, you know, a lot of people breastfeed like in one certain area of the U.S. Is that the same way with how people birth? Are there certain places in America where it's like, oh yeah, there's a lot of C-sections here. There's a lot of, yes. you know. And you know, there's a resource online uh, that's cesarean rates by hospital. And that's eye-opening. So like I live in Orange County. So it's like there are certain hospitals mm -hmm. that have a high rate because uh, there a thousand reasons, but some of the reasons that I know is, um, you know, there's some prim and proper women who don't want to be mud women, who don't want to do what I just did. Mm -hmm. So they may request them, um, which is getting harder to do-ish. But um, so yes, different areas. I mean, it makes sense that different areas would have breastfeeding rates, different birth, you know, diff different types of birth. You go to Boulder, Colorado. So I'm, I have a background in Colorado too, which is why I bring it up. But Boulder, Colorado, which is kind of like a liberal progressive mm -hmm. place and they have a lot more natural birth. They have a birthing center yeah. where some places don't. So yes, it's, you know, each little pocket has, has their thing. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, you're welcome. Well, we're out of time, but thank you all for coming. And if we can just give one more round of applause. Thank you guys. Thank you.